it's only someone who has begun to take seriously the Christian struggle that is then open to appreciating what Christian prayer really is about. Christians are lifelong learners. Initiation into the body of Christ not only provides a place for a person within the sacramental life of the church, but it also presupposes that person's continued pursuit of wisdom. After all, the Great Commission to the Apostles requires not only baptism in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, but also teaching the observance of Christ's commands. One need not accumulate theological degrees in order to grow in the knowledge and love of the Lord, but the Church has always valued the ministry of faithful teachers and promoted the writing and reading of texts that may be used to nourish us all as disciples of Christ. Different eras of church history have required different kinds of teachers and texts, but all of the great spiritual masters have a way of writing across differences of geography, ethnicity, and chronology to pass down wisdom that applies to all believers down to the present day. The simple, unaffected words of St. Anthony from 3rd and 4th century Egypt, for example, may be a balm to the souls of 21st century Americans beset by the spiritual interference of commerce and technology. St. Augustine's resolution of his inner turmoil by describing the journey of his soul to its rest in Christ may do likewise. For a society beset by atomization and loneliness, along with the temptations of lust and abuse, we find hope in the message of spiritual friendship that we find in the work of St. Aelred of Rivaux. Or how about St. Benedict, whose rule may be as viable an option now as it was in the late Roman Empire, when social upheaval and religious mediocrity frustrated the aims of people striving for true holiness. Thomas Akempis's Imitation of Christ was the second most common Christian book to come off the earliest printing presses after the Bible, and it still belongs on every Christian shelf. Likewise, we should all seek a deeper experience of the reality of God through the writings of Teresa of Avila, Catherine of Siena, Francis de Sales, Ignatius of Loyola, and John of the Cross. But where do we start when we approach these works? What are they trying to tell us? To introduce us to all these great Catholic thinkers and more, we turn to a new book from Ignatius Press called Spiritual Masters, Living and Praying in the Catholic Tradition by Archbishop Emeritus Alfred C. Hughes. Concise and pastoral, Archbishop Hughes's book is the perfect resource both for newcomers to the faith and to seasoned Christian disciples who are perpetually open to grace and truth. Archbishop Hughes received a doctorate in spiritual theology at the Gregorian University and served in parish, seminary, and administrative roles in Boston. Pope St. John Paul II appointed him Bishop of Baton Rouge in 1993 and Archbishop of New Orleans in 2002. He now serves at Notre Dame Seminary in New Orleans and is the author of a previous book, Priests in Love with God and Eager to Witness to the Gospel. It is my pleasure to welcome Archbishop Emeritus Alfred Hughes to the podcast now. Archbishop Emeritus Alfred Hughes, welcome to the Ignatius Press podcast. How are you? Thank you, Andrew. It's good to be with you and with our audience. It is, and I know that they're going to be excited to, to hear from you and to hear about your book. The book that we're discussing is a new one from Ignatius Press. It's called Spiritual Masters, Living and Praying in the Catholic Tradition. 
Now, I really enjoyed this book. It was a, a really helpful kind of walk through the thought of a number of really important uh, spiritual writers and figures in the Catholic tradition. Let's start with this question. Where, where did you come up with the idea or, or where, where was the, the origin of, of the idea to, to write this book? Well, Andrew, you know, this has gone through a number of stages of development. Um, I initially experimented with a little course at St. John's Seminary in Boston when I was still serving there. Uh, when I came as Bishop of Baton Rouge, I decided that I, I would like, inspired by Francis de Sales, to offer spiritual formation to the lay people. And so I, I developed a series of public lectures that um, uh, it attracted a good number of lay people, some of whom encouraged me at that time to consider putting it into a book form. So that's what led initially to uh, my attempting to do that. And it's gone through now, this is the third revision of it and an update of it. Um, but uh, um, I try to do two things. One, to recognize that it's important to break open in a step-by-step -step fashion the ordinary steps along the journey of becoming a good disciple of the Lord. So in that sense, it's an attempt at developing kind of a systematic of uh, breaking out of that whole journey. But I also wanted to introduce readers to different spiritual classics to exemplify each of those stages so that it would not just be theoretical teaching, but uh, the lived expression of what that means in, in uh, taking seriously the Christian spiritual life. Yeah, I, and I love the way that you do that with each of the authors and each of the works that you that you guide us through. That, you know, of course, you can read these these works as as an intellectual, as a theologian, but they're also really edifying for for all people, for for ordinary people. And maybe we could start with uh, start from the beginning with the first the first person that you talked to us about, and that's Saint Anthony and the whole idea of desert spirituality. And, and, and solitude and contemplation. You said, you said this, and I, I want to I get your thoughts about this. You say, the words are simple, honest, without affectation. They must be received by people who are willing to be challenged and changed. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, um, can I preface my response to that good question with uh, just mentioning something else about St. Anthony that that I touch on in the introduction. St. Anthony, according to uh, St. Athanasius that uh, provides us some biographical details about St. Anthony's life, mentions how three different, uh, three disciples together came to Anthony to ask him to resolve their problem, trying to identify what was the best path to holiness. And one was claiming that the road was prayer. The second, penance and sacrifice. And the third, works of charity. And Anthony said to them, each of these is a good way, but each is partial. Can you answer this question of mine to you? Why do you suppose so many people propose to begin to live the discipleship life and fall by the wayside. And he was stymied, didn't know how to respond. So Anthony responded himself. Do you suppose that too many people start out on the journey on their own terms and don't allow themselves to be formed 
by those who have gone before them and witnessed to the life well. Now, I mention that because that, in a sense, lays a foundation for, for the whole book I wrote. <laughs> um, trying to draw from the riches of the past and trying to look at the present and the future uh, in light of the challenges we face today. Now, going back to your good question, um, Anthony maintained that uh, if his words were going to have any impact on people, those who came seeking his advice or counsel needed to receive the words without expecting that a full response would be given, but that they would be led by simple words or stories to ponder something that needed to be pondered. That those who gave direction in the, in the desert should do it without affectation, without uh, glamour. And those who were receiving what was being offered should be receiving it with a truly open, receptive, and then a desire to be responsive spirit. Andrew, uh, I think that An Anthony set the stage for uh, helping us to, to recognize the dispositions of mind and heart that are so important if we're going to read the classics well, learn from them, be inspired by them, read them in the right way, not with the student's cap, just looking for information, knowledge, but with the disciple cap, wanting wisdom, true guidance, inspiration, if both desert father or mother and disciple going to seek advice from them, go with that frame of mind that makes all the difference in the world. And so it does for us as we pick up the classics and read them. Yeah. I love what you're saying, and that's a great transition to the to the next person that you talk about. And by the way, the book is not arranged in order of you know chronology necessarily. You know, I like how you 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 know you 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 move from author to author, but it's not in a, a linear line through through time and space. And the next the next person that you talk about is Walter Hilton, who lived I, I suppose almost a thousand years or near thereabouts after Saint Anthony. But you know, you you talk about him as a man who was very brilliant but who also was concerned about the very thing that you just mentioned before, about wisdom more than just you know, intellectual knowledge. And in fact, intellectualism maybe has a certain decadence that he was, he was trying to avoid. I wonder if you could tell us about Walter Hilton and why you chose to put him in the book. Well, you know, uh, Walter Hilton lived in a century, even though it's a thousand years ago, <laughs> uh, not quite a thousand years, but uh, six, 600 years. He lived in the 14th century that has many similarities to our own. Now, obviously, not the technology and, and uh, the more sophisticated uh, developments that have taken place since that time. But think of this. The institutional church was in disarray. The uh, Avignon residence of the papacy during the first three quarters of the century had eroded respect for the papacy, particularly because during the whole 14th century, a hundred years war was going on between England and France and people were allied on both sides of that. So those 
who were on the side of the French, supported the Avignon residency. But those that supported the British were very much opposed and resented the church locating the center of, of her um, ministerial activity in Avignon. Secondly, uh, after the Avignon residency, there was the what was called the Western Schism, with in most of the time two popes, at one point even three popes, elected by different groups of cardinals. The church was divided. And the church was not offering the inspiration and witness that could help ordinary people. After that, the Black Plague that ravaged Europe, one third of the population died. There was no such thing as a vaccine developed in, in those days. People were lost. Pe people looked desperately for some kind of ultimate meaning and spiritual help. Walter Hilton recognized that. And he wrote this treatise that's called The Scale of Perfection, or The Ladder of Perfection, um, as a guide, uh, kind of a map for the process of becoming a good disciple of the Lord and made it available to, to lay people who wanted to respond to a deeper invitation to holiness of life, but were not experiencing help from the institutional church at the time. And then secondly, Walter Hilton also uh, grounds us in appreciating an authentic Christian anthropology. Let's, let's face it, the, the greatest challenge we face in our own time today is understanding correctly the human person. So many of the issues that we face revolve around a faulty anthropology. Now, Walter Hilton retrieved from the scriptures and then Walt, uh, St. Augustine, St. Uh, Gregory the Great, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, what is called the image teaching. We're created in the image and likeness of God. What does that mean? Be created in the image Augustine suggested meant that the deepest desire in the human person, in what the Bible calls the heart, is for God. We inherit a divided heart. We don't recognize often that the desire for happiness is a desire for God, hidden within that desire for happiness. We can move in all kinds of false directions, but the true object of that desire is union with God. The mind is darkened by original sin and needs to be enlightened by the teaching of the Son of God. And the uh, will needs to be strengthened, it's weakened because of original sin. So um, Walter Hilton breaks open a, a fundamental appreciation for how the inner faculties of heart, mind, will transform the whole human person, including the body, in a way that enables us to experience more harmony, more enlightenment, more um, grace to cooperate with in, in saying yes to the Christian spiritual journey. Uh, 
outlines the steps and uh, provided a, a, uh, a blueprint for people in the 14th century. Yeah. Archbishop Hughes, you've already kind of led us to our next figure, and that's St. Augustine. Um, a question about him. So a lot of a lot of what you're doing in the book is inviting us to um, to to spiritual reading, to to engaging with these spiritual masters, which is a, a solitary journey to some to some degree. But what we learn from St. Augustine is that sometimes solitude can be a scary place because that's where we then have to face our inner turmoil. What what can we learn from St. Augustine about that about that journey? facing our inner turmoil? Well, good question, Andrew. You, you know, um, when we still the external noise and try to become quiet and present and receptive to God, we suddenly become aware more consciously of the inner noise. And that can be scary initially and it can be frustrating as we try to persevere with quiet time. And Augustine helps us to realize that uh, what surfaces is important for us consciously and explicitly to address. It doesn't need to be a stumbling block to quiet and prayer, actually we can use it as a stepping stone to God because what surfaces is what's of concern in our lives, what preoccupies us, what absorbs our interest, attracts our attention. That's what surfaces. Now, some of it is good and therefore something we want to build on and some of it is evil, even scary. It can prompt us and the, the devil can use it as an instrument to discourage us. Uh, it can lead us to give up the effort. Augustine encourages us to persevere and to bring to God and to bring to his church uh, a repentant heart, a willingness to be open to the invitation to conversion, to recognize that what is negative within us usually falls under the umbrella of one or another or more than one of the capital vices, pride, envy, greed, anger, lust, uh, gluttony, sloth. And as we become aware of what's motivating us, what's a, what tends to keep us from a closer and, uh, and, and, and more fruitful relationship with God and a capacity to respond to his grace needs to be brought to God with a repentant love. Uh, unless we do that, we don't declare resistance to evil and openness to God's grace to grow in virtue. Yeah. Yeah, that's really wonderful. I think everyone's going to enjoy that chapter, especially because they probably have some familiarity with Augustine and, and the Confessions. A figure that some readers might not know, however, is, is someone that I like a lot, and I was really pleased to see that you included in the book, and that's St. Aylred of Riveau, uh, who talks about spiritual friendship. Tell us more about Aylred. You know, because uh, Aylred of Riveau um, wrote two classics, a number of books, but two that became classics. One was called A Mirror of Charity and the other Spiritual Friendship. Uh, in The Mirror of Charity, which is more fundamental than the book on, on spiritual friendship, he makes clear that um, until we 
receive in the depths of our own soul God's personal love for us, freeing us from those vicious, those vice-rooted tendencies within us, calling us to, to live the true self and let go of the false self. We're not going to love others in the right way. Only when, when we experience the fruit of that profound, merciful love, will we love others and ultimately come back to be able to love ourselves in the right way? Um, so that's his fundamental uh, classic. But the, the one that you were asking about, spiritual friendship, and I spend more time in the chapter on, is, is uh, uh, Ilred's realism about the fact that we need companionship along the way. We, uh, uh, the journey is not an individualistic journey. We... We, we need the church, and and we need companions in the church that um, can support one another, encourage one another, um, and and uh, be particularly respectful of the unique vocation that each has in support of it and support of their living it out faithfully and generously. So uh, he distinguishes between false kinds of friendship, either carnal friendship or friendship based upon worldly values, what I can get out of my friendship with you, uh, to a truly Christian spiritual friendship, which is the only one that's really worthy of the name Christian because it... it uh, allows God to be central, respects the unique vocation of each, is supportive of the development and virtue in one another, and it keeps the ultimate goal of life in mind. Mm -hmm. I wonder, maybe we could dwell on, on Ilra just for one more minute, because, you know, as you mentioned before, that we've got this crisis of anthropology, and it also occurs to me, we've got this real crisis of love and chastity, you know, and, and Aylred is so good on this question of chaste love. I wonder if you could say something more about that. Well, thank you, uh, Andrew. That, that's, uh, that is an important part of, of, of his teaching. Um, you know, we're made for love. And the sexual drive within us is concretely one expression, very physical expression of that desire, need for love. Our relationships with one another are sexual in a broad sense. They don't have to be genital. They should only be genital within the vocation to marriage. But we relate to one another uh, in a broadly sexual way because human sexuality is a, a, a movement out of ourselves to self-gift. Now, it can be easily corrupted in self-gratification. That's a selfish expression of that drive within us, that affective drive. But the gospel invites us to move in the direction of being able to make us a gift of ourselves. We don't become adults in life until we move to the capacity to make a gift of ourselves permanently, faithfully, even in the midst of challenges and difficulties. And uh, uh, Aylward places the concrete call to chaste life and love within that broader context. 
Yeah, thank you for that. That's really, really helpful. And I know readers will uh, take a lot from that in, in that chapter. Um, let's talk now, Archbishop Hughes, about St. Benedict. You mentioned a, a moment ago Walter Hilton's time having certain similarities to our time. I think we might also say that St. Benedict's time has a certain similarity in, in some ways to, to our time. Um, what, is, what is the usefulness of his rule and, and of his witness uh, in, in our world today? Well, the, the reason that I uh, include uh, Benedict's rule is not because I'm promoting or encouraging or thinking everybody should be <clears throat> developing a monastic style of life, but rather to recognize what Benedict originally had in mind that we can build on in our own lives. Benedict did not start out intending to establish monasteries. He was actually invited and asked by some uh, hermits to, to come and, and help them form a, uh, a way of life that enabled them to support one another in being good disciples of the Lord. And Benedict was very attracted to that and he had an extraordinary ability to organize and uh, um, bring some structure to a, a whole way of life. So what Benedict does is to look at weekly life, recognize that on certain days we have different responsibilities. Why not work out a rule of life that can guide us in such a manner that we incorporate in our weekly pattern of life all that needs to be there. For the monks, it was their praying the Eucharist together. It was praying liturgy of hours together. It was doing their tasks, usually at that time, manual labor, agricultural labor, um, in service to feeding and, and supporting the community. Um, it was finding uh, appropriate uh, ways to approach meals that uh, were temperate in terms of consumption but healthy in terms of living, um, how to approach uh, the, the um, uh, needed nourishment for the Christian spiritual life through holy reading. It's interesting that Benedict doesn't incorporate in, into his rule uh, a, a period in the day for making a holy hour or, or the equivalent that we speak of today he had a, a holy reading hour <laughs> mm -hmm. and saw reflective, prayerful reading of the sacred writings of those who have gone before us and been proven faithful and recognized by the church as uh, good witnesses, reading what they had to say as helping us to bring other friends around us to support and inspire and strengthen common living. So I take that and I suggest, let's extrapolate from what Benedict did for what became his fellow monks, first at Subiaco and then at Monte Cassino. What if we were to do in our lives a, a little rule of life and looked to incorporate into our daily and weekly approach to life what needed to be there to sustain us in the road to discipleship. And who is it that we need to incorporate into that rule of life to help us and enable us to help them do the same? Maybe family, maybe friends, Maybe a combination of both, um, but uh, that's 
the way to give a little concreteness to the daily or especially weekly living of discipleship. Yeah, that's great. And maybe just a quick follow-up question. Would you say, Archbishop Hughes, that your typical Westerner, maybe American in particular, has a pretty poor balance of, of work, leisure, and prayer? I, I think that's a significant challenge in the culture in which we live. We don't know what restorative leisure is really all about. Our, our culture tends to suggest that we work hard when we're supposed to be working, but then we enter into a kind of a dissipative leisure, self-serving leisure, self-gratifying leisure. It's escapist. Mm -hmm. And and then we go back to our work. We're, we're not motivated. We're not uh, able to bring to our work a good motivation, good spiritual focus. If we uncover the, the, the best ways for us to experience restorative leisure. I find, for instance, well, one of the most restorative approaches to, to leisure for me is, is reading good spiritual literature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I'm also uplifted by good classical music, a good walk in nature, um, be paying more attention to the flowers, the birds. Um, I'm uplifted by good conversation with good companions. I'm also helped by good physical exercise. Um, I, I like to swim. When I finish swimming, I, I, I feel washed over. Uh, it, it's, it's not taxing to any limbs, but it's exercising all of them. And, and uh, uh, I feel revived. Uh, now, it takes a little experimentation to know what, what is the best restorative leisure for ourselves. Um, that combined with our work enables us to also do our work in a renewed spirit and with the right motivation and letting the work be more a work of charity, a way of serving other people rather than a sense of duties or obligations or responsibilities that I have to fulfill. Yeah. That's wonderful. We may have to skip a few of the of the figures that you talk about, but before we move in move into some of the kind of specifically prayer oriented ones, I want to pause and and also uh, talk about Thomas Akempis and the Imitation of Christ, because for purely selfish reasons, that was a book that uh, meant a lot to me when I was a young man, when I was an undergraduate. Someone gave it to me, and I read it. And I know so many people have have read it and cherished it as well. So I wonder if you would just tell us what, what it means to you and, and why you think it's important for the faithful to engage with that text. Do you know, Andrew, that at, when the Gutenberg press um, was developed, the second most published book was The Imitation of Christ, mm. Bible number one, but The Imitation of Christ. Now, the Imitation of Christ was also written in that end of the 14th century, the beginning of the 15th. We don't know exact date for it. Um, so that same period I was talking about that uh, Walter Hilton wrote in, um, where there was so much darkness in the church and in the wider world. Um, but the Imitation of Christ focuses on a, a more 
personal and affective relationship with the Lord. Mm -hmm. um, now, there are passages in it that can seem to be um, overly negative about the world uh, and and uh, uh, being engaged in anything, but it has to be understood in the context in which it emerged. That's why in each of these classics, I try to identify the historical context so that what is historically conditioned in them can be set aside while what is universal in the teaching can be appreciated and, and hopefully lived. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the imitation of Christ makes real the struggle mm -hmm. that's involved in being faithful in the Christian journey. There are two primary images in the Bible for the pilgrimage in life. Well, one is pilgrimage, one is journey, and the other is struggle, spiritual warfare. Uh, let's be realistic and recognize that the real enemy in life is not other human beings, it's, it's Satan. Mm who has poisoned the lives of some people and to one or another extent has made inroads in each of us. So we have to take seriously, there is a struggle. St. Paul urges us to put on spiritual uh, uh, armor and headgear and sword and mm -hmm. and, uh, and and he also encourages us not to be afraid of the struggle. You know the, the sacrament of confirmation gives us the Holy Spirit precisely to help us to engage in the battles of adult life and draw on the victory that the Lord Jesus has already won, but we need to access uh, by sharing in his grace um, to be victorious in our own lives as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well said. Um, after that point in the book, you, you transition into some figures where you're really, it's as if we're kind of really rolling up our sleeves and thinking seriously then about prayer and about what it is we're doing when we're praying. And, you know, something that I took away from the first few figures that you talked about, um, Guigo's, Guigo's Ladder, Guigo's Ladder, I had actually not we, heard of that. Guigo the second, yes. That was really, Car that Carthusian, was, yes. that was really wonderful. And maybe you can say something about him, but then also Teresa of Avila and Catherine of Siena, you know, in those three chapters, the, the sense that I got reading them was that that what we're really going for is is reality, is is bringing our real selves to reality itself, and continuing in that process of transformation. It, am I reading correctly in these in these figures that you're telling us about? Very, very much so. Uh, you know, Andrew, uh, I uh, postponed the explicit treatment of prayer until that point in the, in the text for a reason. Not that we shouldn't already in the earlier stages been praying, but prayer in the earlier stages it can very easily uh, lead us in the wrong direction. Hmm. It's only after we really engaged in the growing awareness of what needs to be addressed in our life, the conversion, the beginning growth in uh, what charity entails and begun to order our life and developed a capacity to enter into the struggle unafraid that we can more reliably grow in prayer. Now, there are a lot of people in life, and you see, if, if you go into a, 
paperback bookstore. You can pick up all kinds of uh, uh, books on prayer. They're, they're basically self-help books, mm -hmm. um, often psychologically rooted, sometimes drawing on Eastern non-Christian spiritualities. But it's only someone who has begun to take seriously the Christian struggle that is then open to appreciating what Christian prayer really is about. It's about being able to come to God as we are, unfeigned, ungarnished, and letting God speak to us. God's always speaking to us. God has spoken to the human race from the very beginning. But we don't always listen. Mm -hmm. We can't hear. Um, now, Guigo, in a very, very simple little treatise, the, using the analogy of, of being fed on the physical level, tries to break open what it means to be fed on the spiritual level. Um, first, we have to uh, ingest the food. Then we have to chew it. Then we digest it. And then we realize the fruits of it. Mm -hmm. And the same is true on the spiritual level. We need to ingest it through holy reading. Done in the way in which we talked about earlier. Then we chew on it when we try to, for instance, take a passage from sacred scripture, begin with the literal meaning, but then dig more deeper, more deeply into the spiritual meanings that are contained there. Scripture is intended to be a love letter from God. And I don't know about you, Andrew, you're a young man, but when we received love letters before emails and text messages, we, we tried to read carefully what was in the letter, but then tried to read between the lines mm -hmm. for what was in the heart. Well, that's what chewing the scriptural word or the liturgical word is all about. It's moving, not ignoring the literal meaning, but moving more deeply than the literal meaning and uncovering, in a sense, if we can speak of God as having a heart, what is in the heart of God as he's speaking to our hearts. Mm -hmm. And then Grigo says the third step is, this is where he, he uses prayer for the first time. It's our response. It's coming from the heart, not just the mind, but it has come through the mind. It's not anti-intellectual, it's come through the mind, but seep down to the heart. And, and now, I want to make a response. Lord, help me to live this. I, re I repent for not living this well in the past. Or nothing seemed to happen to me as I pondered this text. But please accept this time as an act of love for you, desire to grow in love for you. That's, that's the affective response. Prayer is not primarily communication but growth in communion, relationship. And that involves both mind and heart and will. Yeah. This is wonderful, Archbishop Hughes. We are just scratching the surface. You have wonderful chapters about um, Francis de Sales, Ignatius of Loyola, St. John of the Cross, and, and others as well, some that I had not actually heard of, including Guigo. So uh, I just highly recommend everybody pick up 
a copy of this wonderful new book called Spiritual Masters Living and Praying in the Catholic Tradition by my guest today, Archbishop Emeritus Alfred C. Hughes. Archbishop Hughes, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. Wonderful. Great to be with you, Andrew, and God's blessings upon you and all who have joined us for this podcast.